Georgia Tan was an American child trafficker who operated the Tennessee Children's Home Society, an adoption agency in Memphis, Tennessee. She used the unlicensed home as a front for her black market baby adoption scheme from the 1920s until the 1950s. She was shut down in 1950, but she died of cancer before any charges could be filed. Tan would steal babies from hospitals and from parents, particularly targeting low-income parents and single parents under the guise of representing health and welfare. Hey everybody and welcome to True Crime Paranormal with the Psychic Sisters. This is Katie Weaver and I'm here with my co-host, sister and partner in crime, Christy Brower. Hello. Hello. Hey everybody. How's it going? Well, it's going pretty well. Um, Rhonda had surgery on Friday, so we're just yeah. doing a lot of uh, uh, convalescing around my house, but she's doing great. That sounds good. And other than that, you know, just love and life. Yeah. Lots going on in the true crime world and otherwise. Oh, my gosh. No kidding. So much going on. Sometimes it's a hard decision to decide what to cover and what to talk about. Because mm. we have so many, you know, current things we want to talk about, but we got to hit all the past classics. And I don't know. It gets yeah. a little crazy sometimes. It does. And I have found like as of late, like whenever I sit down with anybody, you know, friends, family, they're like, so tell me about the blah, blah, blah case, you know, and we fall back into it. And I'm like, I don't yeah. mind. I, I love talking about this stuff, but I still go, do you have a life anymore? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I hear you. I hear you. Um, our niece, Mia, was over today. Um, she cleans for us. And so she was cleaning and I was watching true crime a true crime show and she's like watching some more true crime huh and i'm like pretty much all i watch now yeah mm -hmm. not complaining really because right. i pretty much have always been a true crime watcher but mm -hmm. it, it is funny how it does has kind of taken over our lives yeah oh yeah my kids call me and they'll just be like hey uh what you doing oh researching a case oh really okay lay it on me you know? <laughs> yeah oh yeah Rhonda's like that too so what are you guys covering today <laughs> Well, and frequently I'm like, from a true crimer's perspective, that's not very safe. You know, <laughs> things I see yeah. or hear, you know, it's I know y'all are true crimers too. So you get what we're talking about. Right. But anyway, well, I, got, I thought today we'd change gears because we've done a lot of current cases lately. We've done a lot of trauma cases lately. So I thought Oy. we'd do something a little bit different. But before we do that, as always, we need to get a word from our sponsor. We certainly do. Support for True Crime Paranormal is brought to you by Manscaped, who is the best in below-the-waist grooming and hygiene. Ladies, listen up. Manscaped, off Manscaped <laughs> offers precision-engineered tools for you and your man's jewels. For any women out there who have come across a hairy bush, you're now in luck. Manscaped, the best in men's below the waist grooming, have just launched their fourth generation trimmer, the Lawnmower 4.0. Yes, that is the 4.0. Make sure your man joins the 2 million men worldwide who already trust Manscaped with this exclusive offer just for you 20% off and free worldwide shipping with the code True Crime Paranormal at manscaped.com. Recently, a Redditor scare, shared a harrowing tale. He talked about his friend, who recently, while his parents weren't home, decided that would be a good time to clean it up down there. Not having the Manscaped Lawnmower 4.0, he threw his leg up on the sink, grabbed a regular razor, and went to work. Unfortunately, uh, he might not have the best balance. He slipped. He fell. He did a really bad number on his scrotum with the razor. Yikes. And blood was pouring out. 
you know, you have a lot of blood vessels in the downstairs, right? Yeah. So blood was pouring out. He wrapped himself up the best he could with the hand towel, threw on a pair of sweats and headed for the hospital because he knew like he was in big trouble. Mm -hmm. Well, he got to the hospital. They took one look at that situation and discovered that he had mostly severed a testicle and they had to remove it. So he yes. went straight into testicular surgery. <laughs> In the meantime, his mother got home and saw a trail of blood from where his car should have been parked that went in the house, up the stairs, and all the way into his bathroom where there was a substantial pool of blood on the floor. Oh, my God. And being a mother, she right? freaked out. And, you know, not that moms freak out, but, you know, she this was her kid and there was blood. And, my God, has he been murdered. Right. She called the police. The sheriff came out, looked at all that blood, followed it up to the bathroom, and noticed a couple of things she didn't in her panic. A razor and hair in the sink. Ah. And he thought, what if? So mm -hmm. he called the hospital and said, you guys have any uh, shaving accidents come in? And they said, oh, yeah, a bad one that's in surgery right now. Mom and dad headed for the hospital. All's well that ends well, except for one ball. So... <laughs> It's really, really unfortunate that he didn't have the Manscaped Lawnmower 4.0. Right. He could have avoided this altogether. Never would have happened. Exactly. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code TrueCrimeParanormal at Manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at Manscaped and use code TrueCrimeParanormal. Experience premium grooming with Manscaped and keep your jewels. All right. And so there you have it. I yeah. was visiting with my son this weekend. Uh, he purchased the whole Manscaped package about a month before we started repping them. <laughs> and so he can't help me out. But he goes, Mom, he's like, you need to just use your code and just do this for Christmas for everyone. And I'm like, for everyone? And he goes, yeah. And I said, is that a little weird? Like for your aunt to give you, you know, <laughs> below the belt shaving stuff for Christmas? And he's like, no, everyone is shaving down there and you would prevent them from having an injury or an accident. He's And these are freaking awesome. So he's like, you should do it. And I said, maybe I should. I don't know. I was glad to hear it from him that that wouldn't be the weirdest gift ever because we have a lot of listeners that have sons and husbands and I'm sure they're going, I'm tempted, but is this weird as hell to give this yeah. to my son? Anyway, from my son, uh, who is a young adult, he says, not at all. So there you have it. Well, there you go. So it's not weird at all. It really isn't. I think Manscaped's big push is to normalize this. Men right, shave a lot other of parts of their bodies. Anyway. Why not this part too? What's the big yeah. freaking deal? You know, they support uh, testis testicular cancer research. Yeah. Manscaped does, which I think is super cool. Mm -hmm. And it's just, you know, always a reminder that, come on, it's not that big of a deal. Yeah. You know? You've either got a cooter or you've got <laughs> the family jewels. So, you know, everybody's got something down there. Right. Well, part of me goes, I wish they would come out with a ladyscaped. And then I went, I mean, women can use the lawnmower 4.0. Oh, but yeah. I don't know what you'll do with the ball toner. I don't know. I, I mean, <laughs> shall we spray it up here? I don't know. I, I don't do. think so. I don't really know, but maybe it's a know. face toner too. I have no idea. I don't even know what a face toner is. Try it out. Let us is. know. I don't know. I, uh, yeah, I'm not real big on that kind of stuff, but. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, there you go. There's mm -hmm. your uh, big talk for the day. Yeah. All right. Well, let's get into it. Let's talk about this case. Some of you guys have probably heard of Georgia Tan before. Uh, some of you, maybe not, but Georgia Tan, uh, is the reason that we have a lot of the adoption laws that we have. Mm. Because she was a super bad dude. So mm -hmm. her dad was actually a judge. She was raised in affluence, really didn't want for anything. He wanted her to be a concert pianist. So from the time mm. she was five until she was in college, she was in piano lessons and was an esteemed pianist by the time she was in college, but hated it and really wanted to be an attorney like her dad. So he was like, all right, fine. So he helped her. 
get into law school. And this was, you know, this was well before women were practicing law, Mm -hmm. uh, but helped her get into law school. And she did make it through and pass the bar, but there was really nowhere for her to practice. So instead, she ended up taking a job at a children's, well, she went into social work from there and worked as a social worker for a short time. And from there started working in adoption services in Tennessee. And this was one of a few different adoption homes in Tennessee that the state was funding to some degree, uh, you know, for legitimate adoptions, obviously it was an, it was an orphanage, but not a large one. I mean, they were mostly, uh, you know, helping get children moved into foster care or into adoptive homes. Mm -hmm. Uh, but she seriously doubled down on that. And by law, they could only charge what it cost for adoption. And so by law, they would charge $7 for an adoption. And that was right there in Tennessee and a few other states around there. You could adopt a baby from them or a child for $7. Wow. I adopted a kid and it was way more expensive than that. (laughs) Yeah. But what she discovered is that rich people, particularly in California and New York, 80% of her adoptions went to California and New York. People there were paying a lot of money for adoptions. Mm Mm-hmm. And we're paying her a lot of money for adoptions. So she was charging $700 for adoptions in these states. So just for the placement of the child? hmm Because I, I assume the $7 was for the actual, like, legal proceeding? Uh-huh. Okay. So she's charging, like, a finder's fee. Yeah. Let's call it that. Yes. That's scary. That's and magic. shit started doing this sometime in the 1920s. Well, she had a problem. They weren't taking that many babies in. That wasn't that much. Mm -hmm. And the need or call for babies was much higher. So she started coming up with ways to come up with more babies. Oh, God. And so I want to share specifically uh, Alma. Uh, Let's see. Sorry, Alma Sipple. Okay. So in 1946, this woman named Alma Sipple had her baby taken from her. And she was in her early 20s and she was struggling, but she had this baby girl named Irma who was her whole world, but mm-hmm. she was very, very poor and, you know, was taking care of Irma, but was having a pretty hard time. Mm -hmm. and a lady came to her house and told her that she was there from child services to check on Irma and make sure that all was well there. Uh Uh-oh. And Irma just, no, she was young, you know? Yeah. She didn't know. So here's what happened in her words. She says, This lady arrived at her house in a large black town car. She started asking Alma questions about her boyfriend or husband and where he was because she really was single at that point. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in those days, that was kind of looked down on. She introduced herself as Georgia Tan. And she told her the truth about where Johnny was, the boyfriend. And then she saw her baby Irma and that she had a runny nose. So Georgia said that you should take her to the doctor. And Alma said she didn't have money for the doctor, but it seemed like just a cold that would pass. And she said, oh, no, she has to have medical attention. She said, I'll take her. I'll take her and I'll pay for it. Just don't worry about it. Well, you know, we're going to help you out. So she says she's taking her to Memphis General Hospital just to get her checked out. Mm-hmm. So she just hands over her baby. <sighs> And offers to come with, but Alma or Georgia tells her, no, um, it's better for her to just take her. She actually asked her to sign a piece of paper saying that it was okay for her to take her for medical care, which she did. Oh, 
and then in hindsight is not really sure what she signed her rights away guardianship something mm -hmm, something so the next day she's not ever come back and again this was a runny nose you know right. we're not talking about like a horrifically ill baby so she goes to the hospital and irma's there and she looks even better she's jumping on the bed and she asks the nurse if she can uh, you know see her baby and the nurse says this baby belongs to the children's home society and she says well no this is my baby and she says no this baby has been removed from the custody of of her parent and has been placed in the custody of the children's home society mm -hmm. so she tries to get a hold of georgia tan who cannot be contacted she tries and tries the hospital won't let her in anymore she's done mm -hmm. the next week georgia gets in touch with alma and says she's very sorry but irma has died oh my god so Alma is, believes it. She believes it because she, again, she is young and she is poor and she's been in a bad situation right. and she doesn't really know better, you know? Yeah. So what's true, of course, is that no, Irma didn't die. She was sold. She was sold to a family that adopted her. Ugh. so That's here's the horrific it's horrific and and i share that one uh because there's a good account of it but also because there's a happy ending ish on this one mm. later on in life in 1989 alma is watching unsolved mysteries and guess whose face shows up on unsolved mysteries georgia tan georgia tan Oh, and they tell this God. harrowing tale about the way she stole all of these babies from young poor mothers in Tennessee all those years ago. So she calls Unsolved Mysteries and through a series of events, she finds her daughter and makes contact with her. Oh my gosh. And actually is able to reunite with her. Oh, wow. And Unsolved Mysteries says that that actually happened for several families. That's so amazing. It's incredible, right? But, but how sad, my God. But those are the tactics. Yep. Typically taking them for medical care or for other things, taking them completely under false pretenses, pretending to be a child protective worker because she had some credentials where she worked for the, you know, the, the children's home. Right. And so she would just come in and basically throw all of this authority around as if she had any and yeah. convince people that she was there to help, uh, convince people that, uh, you know, that they were in trouble and things like that and just take their children and they just never see them again. My God. What kind of a sociopath do you have to be to do something like that for money? Well, and it gets worse because towards the end of her reign of terror uh, in the 40s, by that time, a lot of babies in her care died. Oh, my God. And died from starvation, died from abuse, died from lack of medical care. There's a lot of allegations against her that uh, things got way out of hand and she became ill she had staff that uh you know you would think were on the up and up she was like in her community she was seen as this like mother Teresa, you know right of that course she, taking care of the children and she lived She's in the high society and, oh you know, my god yeah was given you know a lot of attention for being this wonderful person that was saving the babies in this orphanage and uh, their facilities were pretty slight, and a millionaire donated a mansion to her mm. for her orphanage that uh, they had all of their clerical on the main floor and then the nurseries on the second floor. But uh, doctors later on described that second floor as a house of horrors, that the babies, the kids were not being taken care of. Mm. And at one point in the uh, mid to end 40s, Memphis had the highest infant mortality rate in the country. 
Oh, wow. Mostly because of babies that were dying in their care. Oh, wow. So her staff would run yeah. around in these, uh, you know, like nurses outfits, but they mm -hmm. weren't nurses. They were anybody she could buy off and pick up off the streets that, uh, that would she could pay tell. enough to look the other way. And mm -hmm. so not only were, you know, children suffering at her hands, but they were suffering at the hands of her staff because, you know, they were all keeping each other's secrets. Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. Worse, though, she had an accomplice in the courts. There was a judge, a juvenile court judge that uh, aided her, that was bought off. And so she had this judge who she... You know, whenever she showed up in court with something or with a family or whatnot, they would always just rule in her favor and she would have whatever she wanted oh. because she was paying them. There's also talk that the mayor in that town uh, that was the mayor for quite a long time, that he, too, was easily bought off and that he his name was Gordon Browning, mm -hmm. that he was likely uh, in on this to some degree. My God. No, I'm sorry. Gordon Browning was the governor. Sorry. Oh. That's not, we don't want to blame him. That wasn't his fault. The, but the mayor of Memphis was uh, believed to be at least loosely involved. Wow. So basically, you know, most of the families whose babies and kids she took just had no recourse mm -hmm. got, or got tricked into signing something and just there wasn't really very much they could do. The mm -hmm. other thing that was happening is that they were completely recreating birth certificates. Oh, so, wow. and again, this was only happening with babies that they could sell out of state a ways mm -hmm. where there was just less uh, scrutiny. Right. Sure. sure. So they were cooking up birth certificates with false, uh, you know, falsified names of parents, of birthplaces, even birth dates. So that, uh, you know, if someone, you know, came along later, you know, like Alma and said, uh, that baby, his name is Irma and she's mine, that they could go, oh, I'm sorry. No, this baby's name is, you know, Elise. And she was born in January or whatever. They were just, you know, making up a lot of things to cover up their tracks. Mm. It, it's a horrifying story of how many, they figure that 5,000 babies were stolen on her watch. My God. Yeah. The ability to harm children is terrifying, honestly. How many well, and people imagine people being in a situation like that is young and dumb and disadvantaged. Mm -hmm. You know, and I only say dumb because we're dumb when we're young. I mean, we were all dumb. Right. Just we were just all young and dumb. Not understanding that you have some authority and that as your child's mother, you don't have to turn them over to anybody mm -hmm. without a court order from a judge. Child right. protection workers don't just take kids. They can't. Right. They have, well, to, have, they now, have to involve police and they have to involve right. the courts. And it's not like they just walk in your house and take your kids. They can do that if the police are present and they have, uh, you know, it's justified, but they have a short period of time in which they have to be in court and prove it to a judge. Yeah. Like it's not. Well, and parents always have rights. Yes. You know. Uh, up until the rights would be severed, that is down the road. I mean, right. this is not, they have some rights. They have, certainly have rights to information, mm -hmm. you know, Definitely. and to be heard and seen. But Definitely. they didn't then. They didn't. Yeah. And especially if you were a young single mom, mm -hmm. nobody gave a shit about you or your rights. And if this beloved woman in our society said that you shouldn't have your kid, screw you. Right. Exactly. Well, and, and in a situation like that, you know, who are you going to go to for help? Yeah. Yeah. So by 1950, there was just too much unrest about this facility. And so the governor of Tennessee will give the right person the right credit this time. <laughs> feel a little bad about that. The mm -hmm. governor, Browning, he's the one who called for a look into what's going on here. So Gordon Browning launched an investigation into the society here. Mm -hmm. And they, uh, on September 11th, 1950, they went ahead and closed them. Good. 
So Memphis attorney Robert Taylor was assigned to the case. And this is where uh, Public Welfare Commissioner J.O. McMahon accused her and her cohorts of receiving a million dollars in profits. Imagine a million dollars in 1950. Oh, my God. That's an unbelievable amount of money. Yeah. So they were closed and they were still finishing up their investigation and preparing to launch charges against her. And she died from uterine cancer. Mm. So she was never accountable for her that crimes. Is, and nobody um, was charged. Wow. Very interesting yeah. what she died of, though. I thought so, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting that of all the cancers, yeah. she would get uterine cancer after yeah. stealing so many babies. Wow. Yeah. It's unreal. So apparently 19 of the children who died there were buried in the Elmwood Cemetery, which is a historic cemetery uh, there and in Memphis. And they ended up fundraising uh, in 2015 to put up a monument to those children. Oh, wow. So it is interesting that uh, it seems as though, you know, the legacy lives on. And, mm -hmm. but it was because of her actions and a lot of the stuff that she did that we finally uh, started coming up with more like federal guidelines and mandates and laws about birth certificates and about adoption because of her and others that of course had to abuse the system, you know, sure. and abuse the children. But that's where a lot of the, uh, even now the laws that are in place came from was because of what she did. It really rocked the whole nation when it happened. Oh yeah. But it's just horrifying. The, the marker in the cemetery, but that's only for 19 of those kids. I mean, yeah. it's wonderful that they did it. Don't get me wrong, but where's the rest of them? Yeah. Cause a lot more them. than 19 babies died under her watch. Yeah. And then, of course, all of those that were adopted. Mm. Yeah. Yep. Unbelievable. So. Yeah, I just. I, I don't understand that element of humanity that can use and abuse and exploit children. I know. Like, I just you can't go lower than that. No, no, you can't. You cannot. Mm. Nope. It's just ama amazing to think that, uh, like Alma, Alma died not too long ago at the age of 98. I mean, wow. most of the people that were affected by this have died, you yeah. know, and a lot of them probably died never knowing that their adopted or that their bio parents wanted them and yeah. loved them and that they were stolen from them. Yeah. 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 That they were not abandoned. They were yeah they were stolen oh man the the generational trauma that something like this yeah. creates is yeah then you also have to wonder like how many people knew that this probably wasn't on the up and up you know mm -hmm. when in the state you can adopt a baby for seven dollars and out of the state they're charging you 700 they knew they had to have they gone. knew but that's the privilege of the rich you know they yeah. get the they get the special uh, treatment, you know, they yeah. pay money that they have that's nothing to them yeah. to get the special privileges. You yeah, they, they get the special I'm curious deal. how many of these children that she took were children of color from black families, from native families. There's just no data. Yeah. A lot of it is supposition because they don't really know, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's terrifying. Mm -hmm. I think it could go on for as long as it did and there to be no records. No right. actual knowledge of how many children did she steal? Right. Considering that she started working there in the mid-20s yeah. and died in 1950, this spans three decades, yeah. you know? Wow. Yeah. That is wild. It's crazy. And horrifying. Yeah. So that's it. That's our Monday case. We will be back tomorrow with more uh, Daybell Mayhem. You know, you yes, want it. Yes, we will. 
<laughs> and then we'll be back Wednesday with our MMIW for the week. So mm -hmm. please like, follow, share. We do have a Patreon where we uh, release two extra cases a month. So if you'd like a little more true crime with the Psychic Sisters, that would be the place to get it. And if you head over to Patreon, we have a few different levels of sponsorship. And we always appreciate the extra help. It helps us to keep the lights on around here. So sure does. that's a great way to support us. So thanks, guys. Take care. This has been yet another production of True Crime Paranormal with the Psychic Sisters. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.